Hello, bird nerds. Hello, plant enthusiasts. Hello, habitat gardeners. I'm Grant. I'm a bird nerd. I'm a horticulturist. And today I'm going to talk to you about um, the, the common plants that you'll see in the nurseries that um, you can pick up and be pretty certain you're going to get a good result out of out of them in your garden uh, let me preface and say my experience is all in the east coast so if you're in Perth um, or in the I've got a couple that'll that I know will perform well in really dry climates and um, low rainfall environments but uh, bear that in mind and in future shows we will uh, be a bit more region specific. Um, I'd just like to point out my backdrop today is the Swift Parrot. Uh, thank you for JJ Harrison making that marvellous picture of the Swift Parrot available through Wikimedia Commons so that we can use it. Um, why the Swift Parrot? Uh, because they're on the way out. There's not many of them left. There are migratory species. They breed in Tasmania and then they follow the flower and eucalypt blossom uh, up the east coast or a around um, that southeast corner of Australia. You can see it's there uh, on a eucalypt. Uh, not many left. We'll do a show about the swift parrot coming up soon, but if you care about birds and you care about... Um, particularly our amazing parrots, uh, lean on your local conservation minister or environment minister in Tasmania, Victoria, New South Wales, or the federal environment minister, Tanya Plibersek, and tell her you would like them to still be around for future generations. It's getting to be quite dire. Okay, um, let's, uh, let's get into this. Uh, Here's the topics for today. Top 10 common plants for bird-friendly gardens. And I've put in there 10 rarer ones that you might like to try. I'm not actually sure we'll have enough time to do the, the second 10. So that might be a uh, the next time I go live um, on gardening. And looking at, my, looking at my board, I might even try and fit that in on Wednesday. We'll sort of see how we go. Um, okay, Let where will we start? Let's start with something that nearly everyone is fairly familiar with. It's out and about all over the country. Here we go. Let's start with Banksia integrifolia, the coast Banksia. Now, the reason I've picked this one I've picked it as the sort of the large, one of the large trees or larger trees that form the basis of a good, uh, of a good garden, any garden. Uh, hello, Facebook, everyone who's jumped on. Um, thanks for joining us. It's, uh, feel free to ask questions, leave comments, whatever this is an interactive forum, I hope. I'm not here to give you a lecture. I'm just here to uh, share what I know about um, plants and what I think is is a really good um, starting point. The reason Banksia integrifolia is is good uh, is it's, it, it's adaptable to, uh, obviously, as a coastal plant, it is good in sandy and free draining soils. It's a it's not a front line coastal plant, it's a second line coastal plant, but it will it will handle um, deep sands, but it's also great in sandy loam and it will adapt to clay if it gets enough moisture in in my experience. So as long as it's not going to be, really, really dry, really dry in summer. It's a good option for you. It is available in a number of forms. Uh, the standard form is a medium tall tree. 
evergreen, obviously. Uh, fantastic looking foliage up close. And this is a photo of a particular form, uh, Monte Cola, but, uh, and that's got a serrated edge and you can find that out there in, in the nurseries. But that picture shows one of the um, non-flowering features of the coast banks here. And that's the beautiful sort of silvery undersides to the the leaves. But most people know it for the yellow, lemony yellow flowers. It's not a spectacular um, specimen plant as Banksias go, but it's really, really reliable and it sets um, fantastic seed cones, as you can see there. That's uh, uh, another of the advantages of Banksias. Um, obviously the nectar feeding birds love the Banksias and the seed eating birds get a crack at it too. Um, how do we know that nectar feeding birds love Banksias? Oh look, there we go. Oh look, they're always, uh, they're always on them. Um, you, you can get, as I said, a number of forms of the Banksia integrifolia. You can get, there's these fastigiate forms now, which grow sort of straight up. There's a ground cover form, which I think was called Ostroflora green cape. There are compact forms that you can find uh, out and about. And if you can get uh, local Indigenous stock at an indi local Indigenous nursery, the chances are that you're going to get one of the uh, tree varieties just around the corner from me. I should have thought to take a photo this morning uh, in one of the front yards. There's a beautiful uh, rounded form um, that's growing. It's grows. It's only about as tall as the telephone uh, electric wires, um, but it is a an, a, a wide and low shrub, um, small tree. It's not a shrub, it's a small tree. Uh, really heavy flowering, like really dense flower cover. So, yeah, that's one of my tree recommendations. My, uh, my second tree recommendation is... Eucalyptus leucoxylin, uh, known as the yellow gum. Uh, it's a Melbourne, uh, Victoria sort of local, but you will. There are forms going into South Australia and 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 further up, but really common around Melbourne and in Victoria. Uh, it's it's variable, and it's it's why, one of the reasons why it's popular in the horticulture trade and why you will be able to find a, a eucalyptus leucoxylin pretty much anywhere you go. You may not be able to find this variety, um, Conata, but it's, uh, it's out there. There are a couple of yellow or whitey flowered forms, but the one that you're going to find most often is the pink flowering form uh, rosier, or you might find it at, down as Goolwood Gem or a couple of other uh, trade names. But it's it's super reliable in the southeast, and it's a beautiful small tree. Usually, the horticultural forms are are much smaller than the uh, the wild growing forms. Um, they have a long flowering period, and actually, if you if you bought a couple and you bought a couple of the different varieties that are out there, you will get an extended flowering period. Honey eaters love them, the lorikeets love love them, and look, you might even find a swift parrot if you happen to live in the right place, uh, popping in to get a feed. Uh, quite small fruits too, which means that there is not as much of a uh, hazard if you have anyone with mobility issues in your family. 
um, or uh, overhanging footpaths or anything like that. So really, really good. Um, the particularly the the Goolwa gem variety that I've I've seen out in the trade and in botanic gardens has a really nice compact form, um, whereas some of the white flowering forms, in my experience, um, are quite open. You can see these shrubs, uh, these shrubs, these trees uh, are quite open and they're growing wild in the banks, in, in the Grampians National Park. Um, really good. I've, I've called it a small tree simply because it's not a towering giant. But look, you can't really go wrong, can you? with that beautiful 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 now I, I can take that one down um who's joined us now hello twitch nice to see people on twitch again bear with me because i've got my notes all over the place uh and i'm looking down and around okay let's do another let's do another tree and this is one of my favorites We'll start with one of the reasons I love this tree. Aloe casuarina littoralis, or the drooping she-oak, um, has a number of reasons that it's a beautiful tree in a... Uh, even small gardens, you can find room for one of these. The form is, is marvellous. It will um, droop down and almost touch the ground if you get if you're lucky to get one of those particular specimens but while they're flowering they are interesting now if you, they have because they're um, uh, a conifer related to the um, related to the true conifers but they're not actually a pine or or whatever, but they're cl they're related, okay. So males have one kind of flower, and you might know from pine trees, the Pinus radiata, that they have the male flowers that release all the pine pollen. Um, well, she oaks or um, casuarinas, aloe casuarinas, have the same uh, habit. These are the male flowers, so they're quite decorative. These are the pinky ones that you'll see around. But look at the female flower. Female flower, and that's on quite a young, uh, on quite a young plant, but very different, right? Um, what happens after flowering? You get the fruiting uh, cones, the fruiting bodies, and who loves these? Cockatoos. Cockatoos love these. So you may be lucky enough. Uh, I've even seen yellow-tailed black cockatoos in my vicinity um, feeding on them in my local park. There's a grove of them in one corner of my local park. Um, just, just beautiful. Just beautiful. Um, Chris Coburn, thank you for the Facebook like. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, reminder, you can say what you like in the comments. You can ask questions. I'll, I'm pretty good with this stuff, so I can shoot from the hip if you've got some questions. Now, where will we go? Where will we go next? Um, let me just take that one down. Uh, so we've done, we've done three trees, right? Where will we go now? I'm going to go down to the tufty, the tufty plants, so that we. Uh, don't miss out. Where are we? One of my favourites. Now this is Poa la Bladiera. Now don't get too hung up about which Poa you should get. Um, there's there, oh, there's there's quite a, there's quite a few in the trade now, and there's quite a few cultivars available. But la Bladiera is more droopy than most of them when it when it gets mature when it gets large and the, that habit is really evident in this uh in this shot 
But there are two or three others which are really common in the trade and are just useful because they're tufty. But don't be tempted to just buy one. I would look for small plants and and get a bunch of them. Fringe a path or or fill one end or you know maybe a corner if you've got a jutting corner or something fill it with those things so that they you create tunnels and and uh, usable places for lizards and you know if you've got the small birds that they can hide they can use shelter but of course grasses have flowers a flower spike and Rosellas love them and you'll even get the bronze wings and whatnot if you've got them in the area come in and of course finches and whatnot. Now what have we got here? Um, gang gangs, gang gangs. Yes Naomi, gang gangs do like casuarinas but you are probably more likely in most gardens to find um, gang gangs going for things like Hawthorn berries and ketoniasters and things like that. Um, they, but they, they will eat fruits. Actually, let's uh, let that gives me an idea. I'm going to have to invite um, Erica Roper onto the show to talk about the Hungry Parrots project. And I would love to know what gang gangs uh, prefer. Naomi, I, I might suggest that Syzygium and Eugenia or Acminas, depending on how old your nursery label, uh, la your nursery labels may be, any of those sort of lily pilly kind of plants might be a good option for them as well. Uh, I'm going to defer to um, uh, to Erica's knowledge on that i will follow it up for you and find out um i have seen them on casuarinas but i do know that the um uh the yellow tailed black cockatoos are probably like the are probably uh more likely to be found feeding on your casuarinas than uh than a gang gang would be but hey wouldn't that be wouldn't that be just lovely to have gang gangs in your garden. Tell us that, Naomi. Have you got them around you? Uh, I used to have them visit when I lived um, in uh, in eastern Victoria on the Gippsland Lakes. Uh, rarely, I was far more likely to, to have galahs and yellow-tailed black cockatoos coming through. Um, resident galahs, resident sulphur-crested's. Uh, cockatoos gang gangs were seasonal visitors um trying to think i saw them on my hakias a couple of times yeah and and i saw them attacking flower buds too i had a grevillea leucopterus which throws up white flowers on a big long flower spike um and i did see them pulling those apart a few times but yeah we didn't get them in very often uh, they were attracted, I think, to the fact that we had mature eucalypts in the, all my neighbours had old mature eucalypts, stringy barks. Um, I don't know, I, and they never hung around for longer than a couple of hours, so they obviously weren't um, living near us. They were passing through, so, yeah. I'll, I'll have to defer to... Um, uh, to Erica's greater knowledge on that when we, um, when I get to speak to her. Okay, what have we got, Naomi? Uh, uh, in the Angophoras. Okay, now the question, I would have a question for you. Now, for those who don't know, Angophoras are very closely related to eucalypts. Uh, so they have that uh, classic eucalypt kind of flower and they also set a seed that is quite similar to maybe the red flower and gum if you're aware of that um, the carimbia uh, fissifolia um, so they may have been getting 
into young buds or something like that. So if you if you notice, Naomi, let us let us know. Let me move on. Where will we go now? Oh well, we've done those. We've, uh, the Allo Casuarina. What more can I tell you about the Allo Casuarinas? Too. Let me just say, um, free draining soils, but also uh, the Littoralis is pretty good in coastal situations, um, but also periodic inundation. They're fine with that. Okay, let me go to another large shrub. Large shrub. Some may call it a small tree. Now, I couldn't get a, uh, a photo that I was allowed to use of the form. But this is Hakea suaviolens, otherwise known as the sweet hakea. Um, a couple of reasons why I have got this up here and why I picked it over a number of the other common hakeas. One, you can see the flower there. It's quite small. Insects seem to really like it. So um, it it's not only a hakea, or well, a lot of hakeas are great for honey eaters, but this is one that will bring in insects and, you know, obviously insect eating birds if you've got insects in there. But they also have a woody uh, fruit cone, again, which cockatoos will get into. Um, but the cones are quite decorative and that gives you something else to feature if you, uh, you know, want to add some interest to your garden. And what I like about the uh, Suave Islands hake here, which you you will often see alongside Hakea salicifolia, which is the willow leaf Hakea in nurseries. And people will often lean towards the willow leaf the um, because it's not prickly. Well, the whole reason I like the Suave Islands is that it is prickly. Why is that good? One, you can use it to direct traffic in your garden. So if there's places where you don't want people to use the shortcuts or whatever, you can pop this this one in. It's a it's a reasonable screen, like it won't totally block off um, the view behind, but it will soften if you've got to look out at a fence you don't like or a neighbor's house that is you know maybe zinc loom siding on the side or whatever and you're trying to soften it this is really good for that but uh, it's spiky which means that it gives the birds somewhere to hide uh, somewhere to hang out but it's not so dense that you won't be able to see the birds so that's my uh, that's my reason for liking it apart from that it smells nice when it's in flower it's got a, uh, a heavy sweet perfume scent um, you can't really go wrong with that, can you? Um, let me see. Where will we go now? Where will we go now? Um, small or medium shrubs. Let me let me go. Uh, I'll put up my one of my favourites. You'll see this listed a couple of ways in the in the nurseries. It's Coria reflexa variety numulara folia. I think I might have left an M out of that one too, by the way. Um, or you will see it as Coria numulara folia. Um, it's, it's a local plant to a lot of coastal uh, areas, in uh, certainly around Melbourne. Uh, has that beautiful lime uh, lime yellow flower and it's just really easy from that I've found really easy to grow great in containers funnily enough that um, photo I think if one is one in a container but it's a great filler shrub uh, 
generally will grow knee to hip height to give you an idea, but it can spread, um, you know, maybe two metres, two metres wide. The underside of the leaves are generally quite greyy. They've got that grey-green foliage up, colour on the top, not shiny and a little bit furry. And some some of them will have even a rusty colour under the leaves. So again, they add a bit of interest, a bit of texture. Um, and the new growth has is sort of russet brown. So the stems are... are a russet brown so interest for for a long period of the year but they also flower for um uh, for months let me just uh let me just ch consult my my notes while you look up there and there's my reminder too to keep um ask a question or make a comment uh oh thanks more more love too not a, not only a thumbs up we've got a love thanks again for that uh okay namilara folia oh i'm being oh, i'm checking one of my references and it's telling me that it only grows to 10 centimeters high sorry that's bullshit uh see them much bigger than that uh where's the flowering let me see um, gee, not even not even telling me that. Um, I've seen it. I think pretty much most of the most of the year. Corias are, are great in that they will often be flowering in winter, which is when the birds um, need them, want them, like them. Uh, now I've. I've kind of cheated. I've called this one of my other of the ten, but it's Cor the the standard Corea reflexa. Now Corias have got so many uh, varieties. I love this one because it's just a delightful colour, um, and the, they fla really long flowering. I mean, you'll find them flowering in in autumn, in winter um and through spring so general they're generally done by summertime but if you do a light tip prune and corias generally re um, respond to both light tip pruning just before they really set their buds so you can you can get in and do a really light tip prune and they'll st and you won't set them back so that they miss the flowering season but they also like uh, periodic hard pruning. Um, so if you if you're not really good with if you're not confident with pruning, corias are great, uh, very very forgiving, and really floriferous. There's my uh, my botany term for the day. They will set heaps and heaps of flowers. Can't go wrong with a coria reflexa. Uh, honey eaters love them. Obviously, um, they are just, every garden should have one. There we go. There's my comment. Every garden should have at least one Corea. Um, let me go to a medium shrub. Okay. Banksia spinulosa. Now, there's a heap of... Uh, varieties of Banksia spinulosa, um, the hairpin Banksia, and sometimes sometimes you'll see them called Banksia colina as well. Some places will, some people call colina a variety of spinulosa. Um, I'm happy to go with spinulosa var variety colina um you'll you'll see it in lots and lots and lots of nurseries it's very common it's easy to propagate and it's really easy to manage in the garden but it has a number of forms that are available 
um, generally, because it's so variable, it's really hard to pin down the size that you you're going to see it is see it at. But you generally won't see it lower than sort of a metre at fully grown, but it can grow to, you know, three and a half, four metres, I've seen it, and it will spread to that kind of uh, distance as well, but you're far more likely to see a bush that's two to three metres. Quite an open habit. Um, the flowers set at, uh, at the point where um, new branches, small branches, set, uh, uh, shoot out from from the main stem uh, so they're sort of they're not terminal you won't find the flowers at the end of the branches you'll find them held more closer into the middle of the bush which is um, which which means that wh when you plant that when you prune them excuse me when you prune them and the plant responds by sending out uh, shoots that's where you're going to get a flower. So if you want a denser plant with more flowers, but also um, a much denser, less spreading habitat, these need to be pruned regularly. They do like being pruned, um, in my experience. But one of the best things about the Banksia spinulosa is that it produces copious amounts of nectar if you get the right, uh, the right one. And if you're growing from, if, if you get a seed grown plant, it can throw flowers that are sort of yellow to orange to or, uh, or to having styles uh, in the flowers, almost as almost black. Uh, so you can get very dark colored ones as well. Um, there are, uh, there are prostrate, prostrate forms. Uh, there are dwarf forms. Uh, birthday candles is a really common one from uh, uh, that you'll see out there. Can't really recommend it highly enough as a bush shrub banksia rather than a tree. Um, so yes, 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 yes. I didn't. Uh, where will we go? Where will we go to next? Let me pull that one down. Okay. Don't forget, keep asking questions. Oh, and the other thing too today is I haven't prepared slides for all of the um, the sort of rarer plants because I was really hoping that you guys would um, uh, would join in. Now let me let me look at my. Uh, at my list, what have we done? Eucalyptus leucoxalan, yes. Eucalyptus integrifolia, yes. Alacasurina littoralis, yes. They're the three trees. Large shrubs, Hachia suaviolens and Banksia spinulosa, done. Okay, best small shrubs, Coria reflexa and Coria reflexa numillarifolia, done. Best tufting plant, or... Uh, Poa labelladiera, done. And again, other po other poas, uh, they're interchangeable. Uh, keep going, keep going. Uh, hello, YouTube. Nice, nice of you to join us. Hello, Facebook. And again, hello, Twitch. Great to see you still. Um, okay, I'm got. Uh, I've got a. Um, a shrub, which is also a great ground cover. So let's start with the ground cover. Have I uploaded it? Oh, I haven't uploaded the... Uh, uh, I haven't uploaded it yet. That's pretty hopeless of me. So let me put this up while I actually try to upload the thing I'm wanting to upload. This is um, Aromophila glabra. Which this form, Murchison Magic, is a um, is a medium shrub, which is really worth considering. People often don't want to think about using um, Eremophilus 
because they have a reputation for being difficult and people will often have purchased one of the um, you know, one of the really beautiful, beautiful, beautiful ones. Um, they're a West Australian plant. They're often a desert plant and they are just stunning as you can see from from that picture um, but they they are susceptible to root rot um, or some of the varieties are susceptible to root rot and uh, a lot of people I think they're like baronias a lot of people have had their hearts broken by by buying them and growing them and finding that they just fail, um, I would I would say that you're pretty safe for giving uh, Eremophila glabra a a try. There's heaps of varieties out there, but there are grafted eremophilas which you'll see out there in the in the nurseries <clears throat> and they've usually been grafted onto a myopora and one of the boobiellas and the boobiellas are um, far more reliable in in eastern australia and that gives you the opportunity to grow some of the really difficult ones like um, and eucaly oh, eucalyptus eremophila nivea is out there everywhere in the in the nurseries now, but you will pay a premium for a grafted one. But Glabra is reliable. I I think as lo actually as long as it doesn't get too humid, they are sub subject to rotting with high humidity. Um, now. Eremophila glabra Murchison Magic is a shrub variety, but this is the one I really want to highlight. The prostrate form. Um, you'll see a couple of uh, trade names out there. I think there's one called Kel Kelberry Carpet or something like that. But um, the reason I know that it performs well and in some difficult areas is that the variety of Eremophila glabra that is being used by my local council and I am in the Brimbank Shire um, in a lot of the garden beds fringing the shopping centre in St Albans they have the orange flowered form of Eremophila glabra in the garden beds and people walk over it and ride their bikes over it and push shopping trolleys over it and it just keeps hanging on so i'm prepared to recommend it as a really good plant that is common in the trade now uh never never used to be but you should be able to find eremophila glabra the prostrate form but if you can't find the prostrate form any of the other sizes, and of course, it, uh, it prostrate, small shrub, uh, it's well worth a go. Grey foliage, um, not glossy, uh, not really hairy, slightly tome and toes, slightly, slightly furry to the touch. Um, you can find it in yellow, pale yellow through to orange flowers, depending on the form. Nectar feeding birds love it. Obviously, if you get a low growing form, you're giving some refuge to the smaller birds and lizards, frogs, they all need somewhere to hide and you can't go wrong with a good ground cover. Um, just reminding you, you can ask questions or make comments. You can tell me I'm a goose. You can tell me you've tried that and it didn't work. Or, oh my God, I've got some and they're fantastic. Um, always looking for your recommendations and your experiences as well. All right, another ground cover. I'm going to pop in here now. Not a great photo, 
but it is a great plant. Um, Grevillea laurifolia. Now, there's lots of grevilleas that are great um, as ground covers, and actually I might pull a few more up where we can share the screen, but not... Um, uh, but not download the photos because I couldn't get any. Um, uh, yeah, there's a nice one too. Um, I will, I will share the screen with that one. I think in a minute. Sorry. Um, yeah. So Crevillia laurifolia. Let me let me talk about that. Why is it called laurifolia? Well, because it's got leaves like a laurel. In the, like the bay tree, um, I I discovered this one actually at the school I went to had lots and lots of grevilleas uh, and hakeas and everything, but piles of grevilleas that weren't really common, weren't really well known. Uh, and this one was on a fairly steep slope and holding lots of leaf litter and whatnot. Uh, it, we, within it shall we say so the leaves would ri raise up uh, a little bit and trap all the eucalypt leaves and bark as they were shedding uh, coming down down the slope and holding onto it and that in turn rotted down and was really improving a pretty ordinary um, soil now it it will grow it will cover an area of about three meters so you can put them at quite safely at one and a half metre centres and they'll do nicely. They'll grow in semi-tropical areas too. I've seen them quite far up the, um, up the coast in New South Wales being used. Um, new growth is not that green colour. It's a lovely bronze colour and the stems are sort of reddy. Um, and doesn't mind regular pruning, does not like really hard pruning. Um, so yeah, likes, prefers well-drained soils, doesn't mind drying out occasionally, loves full sun and filtered sun. So a, a, a part shade uh, situation is really good what else can i tell you about it as you can see there the flowers are sort of that reddy maroon color um yellow tip on the on the style so they're good looking uh when i had had a couple growing and again this was in eastern victoria i would regularly see the spine bills coming down and feeding on the ground um, so I'm guessing they're quite tasty for um, honey eater dinner. But I did used to see the uh, blue tongue lizards crawling through it and hot. I think they provide shade, obviously, if it gets too hot for them and they're um, a good refuge for somewhere. Um, yeah, if, they, if they're feeling threatened. All right, I'm going to now... Uh, let's share uh, share the screen. This is not my. Well, this is a uh, another one that I really like to recommend as a ground cover. That is not one of the regular ones you'll find out there. Um, here we are. Let's pop it pop it in. Oh, I've got to take that one away. Take that one away. There we are. Make that full screen. That's that one. There is Grevillea repens. Um, doesn't have the smooth edge to the leaves like Grevillea laurifolia does. Um, it's got that toothpaste, uh, toothpaste, uh, serrated, toothbrushy edge a little bit. Um, it's pretty much pretty similar to laurifolia otherwise um it's uh not quite as rampant shall we say 
what, what do we say? Holly, sort of holly like leaves. Um, beautiful, beautiful looking plant, I reckon. Um, not quite as reddish, not quite as maroon, the flowers. Um, uh, likes dry shade. That's another one of the problem solvers for that plant. Dry shade under eucalypts and perhaps um, perhaps under angophoras. Naomi, remember we were talking about under the angophora in the last session, I think. Um, this could be one to try because dry shade is something that it... Uh, it does like, um, again, temperate, subtropical. Um, I've got no experience with it in frost, but I imagine that they, uh, I imagine that they will handle a light frost because that's just like a light prune, I would say, for them. Um, birds love them, again, um, so there we are, uh, there we are with that one. What have we got here? Um, great, thanks, Naomi. Yeah, um, it's it's pretty common out there in the trade. Again, with these recommendations, I've tried very hard to make sure that they are going to be out there in the trade. Um, now I reckon, I think, I think that's. I think that's ten. Um, I think I've done. I think I've done me ten. Let me just count up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, that's actually eleven. Um, now I'm going to let me just remove that for a minute. Bear with me while I look off. I'm going to. Um, I'm going to find a couple of my other like honourable mentions. Um, I wasn't sure which one I would I would tell you to go, but we were talking about um in the last stream, and I just wanted to show, and we will do these on the... Uh, as screen shares, so bear with me again here. Um, but there's two Ariostomans I want to uh, promote. Oh, are they called Philothecas now? Oh, hell yeah, look at that. Um, they are too. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, that was a bit ordinary of me, wasn't it? I haven't even I haven't been keeping up with the keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. Okay, let me let me start with this one. Let's oh. Sorry for the dead air folks, but um I'm finding the people aren't liking the uh, uh, I hate it when people always want to promote their own crap instead of the plant um, oh there's a good one there's a good one let me let me see this one oh this is one of the uh, oh for crying out loud Finally, finally, finally. Oh, no. No, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> oh, another comment. Good. That's good. You keep keep telling me stuff while I'm... Um, uh... Okay. Insect attracting plants. Now, funnily enough... Funnily enough, um, 
I've just been talking about the eriostomans or the philotheca, as we're, uh, I'm now finding that they are called. Now, here's the habit of, of them. Uh, that's varicosa. And this is myoporoides, philotheca, or eriostomans. Now, they attract lots of insects. Um, Baronias are also great for attracting insects. Um, oh, gee, let me... Just give me a second and I'll, I'll go to my... Um, uh, going to my notebook um, oh all right I'll unshare the screen now and I'll go back to me um, go back to me okay all right Naomi thanks for that question that's a that's a beauty there's so many of the really nice small flowered plants that will bring in all sorts of insects. Um, if you want, if you want caterpillars, things that um, birds can feed on, uh, lots and lots of the uh, banksias, hakias um, are, are conducive to those, you know, little looper caterpillars and things like that. Um, Ostromertus, Ostromertus dulcis, I think. All the syzygiums uh, will bring in uh, moths, butterflies. Um, this, these philothecas or eriostomans, which we were just talking about. Uh, exalata, Croia exalata. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, Corias a a, a are really great for that. Um, you'll get beetles coming in for a lot of the uh, eucalypts as well. Oh, um, just trying to think. I, that, that's a whole. That's a whole other. That's a whole other show. Um, uh, yeah. Look, the uh, different different caterpillars are adapted for different plants generally um insects of course it, it, what i showed before actually let me let me go back to the way the grasses were used where are we um where are we where are we, where are we? okay so the way the powers were used now one of the one of the problems that we often have in um in any sort of garden design is people are uh, unwilling to mass plant. And they think when they go to the nursery, uh, say you've got a budget for 15 or 20 plants. The thing everybody tends to do, and I must admit I used to do it because there's a, t a touch of the collector in me when it comes to uh, plants, is to go out and get one of these, one of those, one of these, one of those, one of those. But that's not how habitats work, right? That's not how, it's not how the bush works. So mass planting is a great idea. And I mean, just these grasses here give you an idea that you are creating a, a, a mini habitat by planting in this way. Um, le healthy leaf litter brings in insects. Um, a variety of different flowers brings in insects. A variety of different colours brings in insects. A variety of different types of flowers brings in insects. Um, uh, will power grow in a shady spot? Gee, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, dry shade... Um, Oh, actually, let me come back to that in a second, Naomi. Um, and Chris, we're about to get to you. Yeah, 
that's the whole point, Naomi, about mass planting. They do look great, mass planted. And it's much better than one sole plant. A lot of plants are great for using as a specimen plant. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying don't ever do that. But I, I like people, and I always, when I was working in, in nurseries and, and had my own, I was always trying to talk to people in terms of what is the effect you want? Where are you going to put this plant? How's it going to interact with what you've already got there? And, um, uh, you know, it, will, will it serve a purpose? I'm actually, I'm going to get to you in a second, Chris, but just... Um, Banksia spinulosa is one that, yeah, look, that's you can buy one of those, but put it in amongst your your hakea suaviolans and alongside your alocasurina uh, littoralis. Um, you know, below below your leucoxalin, your eucalyptus leucoxalins. You know, that's what I am just really trying to encourage people to think about. Um, when they are, and even, you know, when you look at even the Ariostomon, it's, you don't want just it on its own, but if you've got some plants that are, most people have got a garden bed where perhaps they've put, you know, maybe it's, let's think, think six or seven metres long and they've only got three plants in it. Well, if you want to bulk it up, go and get some small plants and, couple of ground covers and throw them below it so that one you know, keep the keep the weeds down uh, you'll spend less money on mulch and you provide a whole lot of habitat for small birds and insects now um, let me let's put Chris's comment up um, Chris I'd really be interested if you can tell us more about what the bees uh i don't know much about cuckoo bees um tell sounds like you're a bit of an enthusiast so why don't you tell us about um about those and let's discuss it uh and naomi let me let me just refer to the powers i'm going to check if there's any difference between the uh um most of the species uh, see if any are more, are shade, more shade tolerant than others. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, sorry for the dead air. I've got three books and my folders of notes. Um, I never throw out my notes about plants. And I'm, I don't think anyone, if anyone tells you they know everything about anything, they're telling you fibs, right? Um, my... Just checking the Poa Australis. Um, yeah, certainly, certainly the the powers that I'm looking up are saying filtered sun. My experience with with powers in the landscape is I don't think I've ever tried to use them. In heavy shade, um, I'm. This is where I need a co-host so that I can, um, <laughs> I can throw to them and say, "Here, fill the time while I while I look something up." I'm just checking. Uh, yeah. How much, uh, how much shade? Give me an idea of that, uh, Naomi. Um, uh, 
sorry, sorry. I know that this dead air is um, not very entertaining. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do a Google search and I'm gonna see if that tells me anything at all. If I use uh, dappled constant shade, okay. Uh, Oh. Yeah, what what I am finding in looking up the um uh looking up is that yeah, I, I picked Poa La Bladiera for the reason that in my experience they do grow well in sort of a wooded Semi woodland uh, situation, um, better than the other ones that I'm familiar with in in part shade, dappled shade. I I would give it a try if you can find Poa La Bellardiera uh, rather than Poa. Um, yeah, that would be that would be my that would be my recommendation. Or uh, Cyber Eye. Cyber Eye? Power Cyber Eye. Or is it Cyberiana? No, I think it's Cyber Eye. Power Cy Cyber Eye. They, they're the two I would look for, uh, Naomi, and give those a try. Um, otherwise, if you would like to try a different tufty, grassy kind of plant, go for like a um, one of the Dianellas. Uh, Tasmanica or um, yeah, ta Tasmanica or L Longifolia, Longifolia. Um, I'm using both pronunciations because that's the way you'll hear them in the <laughs> in the trade. Some people will say Longifolia and some will go Longifolia. I don't really care as long as you get the right plant, right? Um, yeah, Chris, I'm putting your put your comment up again. Uh, really interested to know more about those native uh, native bees. Oh, and Naomi, I'm going to actually give you a couple of um, uh, uh, um, uh, let, let let me let's just wrap a little bit. Uh, I wanted to talk about some of the acacias that are great in the. Uh, in the garden for the small birds. So perhaps, uh, perhaps I'll take, uh, uh, take the picture down and put me up there again. And uh, there we are. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of really good prickly acacias. Uh, Ulyssifolia, Ulyssifolia with a, with a U. Um, Uh, that would be one I would try. What's, what's the hedge? Uh, what's the... I don't know which are the indigenous ones in your, in your region, in your area. So perhaps the, uh, the local nursery might be able to give you some, um, you know, particular recommendations, but get something really prickly. Uh, grevilleas too, small grevilleas that are prickly. Um, you can't go wrong with the old-fashioned grevillea rosemarina folia for habitat for, um, they provide refuges for, you mentioned the um, the thornbills and the fairy wrens and, and whatnot yeah. There we go. Let's come back here. Um, robins are going to want generally taller uh, or larger plants um, than the fairy wrens. Thornbills, depending on which, excuse me, depending on which ones you've got, 
want different kind of uh, uh, kind of plants. So the striateds and the browns will be in a different kind of habitat and have different requirements than, say, the yellow rump thornbill, um, weebills, and and uh, yellows are going to be different again. <clears throat> I think you can't go wrong. So you got browns and striated. Okay. Now, browns like like a bit more um, a bit more cover. Striateds like the uh, the the smaller trees and the taller trees. So um, they like probing crevices, looking for food. So the st stringy barks and the the gums that have a furrowed bark um, are very conducive for them. Uh, Hakea sericea, which is a really spiky one, uh, um, so I'd give them a uh, give them a, a, a try as well. Um, that's a that's a whole that's going to be a whole different show, I think. Uh, Naomi. Um, should I write that on my whiteboard? Let me, uh, let, me, uh, let, let me do that while I'm, uh, so I don't forget. Um, I'll do it in red too, so that it's important. Uh, Thornbills for Naomi, all right. That will jog my memory when I make my next... Uh, Uh, straw pole, straw pole for you guys there too. Um, this is trying to formulate when I keep doing these plant shows. Um, thanks, Chris, for for that. Uh, ah, very good. Thanks for the thanks to the snake catcher. Uh, obviously, a nature nerd. Um, how often do you get snakes in? Uh, I like the copperhead, by the way. Copperhead, copperhead, and red-bellied black snakes. My favourite, my favourite snakes, other than the whip, the the whip snakes. They're they're really cool too. Uh, okay, straw poll amongst you guys. Before I go back to Naomi's point about thornbills. Uh, uh. Excuse me. Okay. Um, I'm thinking of where to fit these in. Now, every second Monday, I, I don't have holly uh, as a rule, even though we haven't had holly for a little while. Um, do you like the Monday time slot or would it be better for you in either an evening, maybe a Thursday or a Friday, or would like a Saturday or Sunday morning, early in the morning, and by early I mean sort of nine-ish or ten-ish, so that I can give you ideas before you go to the nursery, before you piss off to Bunnings and buy shit. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so stick those, stick your thoughts on that in the comments. Um, uh, the... Chris mentioned uh, Naomi the um, crowias and uh, uh, I'm I'm going to add in the philotheca or eriostomans. They draw in lots and lots and lots of insects, but um, you also want to make sure that you've got that. Uh, I know from a horticultural point of view, I always talk about mulch is important. And it is for the plants, but sometimes the stuff that we all clean up is what the small birds need and love because they're, I know I used to watch the fairy wrens at my place. I had a group of, a, you know, about a dozen, maybe up to 15 that, that would, uh, come through and they would just systematically move through the vegetation uh, either down down the fence line or then through each of my beds and I had big 
big beds that I planted with the varying uh, layers of, of foliage. So I would either start with tall ones on the outside and then come down, you know, to the uh, the far side of the bed would, would be where the lowest plants are. Or I would do, you know, two edges up to taller things in the middle. Um, um, da, da, da. So... Um, Loose leaf litter is really important. Now, I, I know that if you're in a fire-prone area and all that, people want you to rake it all up and get rid of it. But I, I would try and find an area in the garden where you can <clears throat> have some leaf litter. And if fire is a big risk, make sure it's in a place that isn't, that it isn't connected to somewhere else so that you would have a break of lawn or paving or something um, that doesn't lead it to somewhere that's going to burn down a structure. Um, and this is all part of good garden design. Um, but leaf litter is really, really important for those small birds. Um, and, and, for, and for things like, um, you know, you, you mentioned robins. Uh, Naomi, I used to like watching the yellow robins uh, tossing leaves over, looking looking for treasure. Uh, the uh, the thrushes uh, do it. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's stacks more. Um, the grey grey shrike thrush. You know they they're all going through that. Uh, that ground level looking for food. So it's important not just to think about the plants, but also what materials you use for mulch. Um, another tip too, I was uh, thinking about where stones and rocks are really common now as a mulch surface. And I, and, and I, I think rocks are great. But if, you, if you're using rocks, every now and then, at one edge, stick a, stick a stick underneath, uh, just under the side, so that it lifts it up, up off the ground ever so slightly. So there you create an opportunity for frogs or for beetles or for uh, lizards, skinks to, to hide under, uh, rather than everything being flat. So... Just, just think just a little bit, or just pop a couple of pebbles under, uh, under a big rock or, you know, flat rock that lets them get in. So that would be that would be great. Um, Naomi, thanks for your comment about the times. Um, yeah, I want to try and set a couple of regular ones, and where I can do. You <laughs> oh. oh. That's terrible, isn't it? Um, don't know why I was up so late last night. Um, a couple of regular spots to talk about different plants, maybe shorter but more regular. And, you know, I've got about 100, 100 topics. Uh, I went through this once before. Uh, and I'm thinking of actually doing a gardening channel so that I don't fill up the bird emergency stuff with too much plant stuff. Um, good idea? I don't know. You tell me. Uh, what's Naomi's comment here about the fire and leaf litter? If a fire came, I'd be stuffed. Yeah, a hillside. Yeah, I used to live on a hill too. Um, uh, if a fire came, it'd be like a freight train. Yeah. I, I, I had the view, Naomi, and, you know, I, I'm pretty out on my own on this here, but if you live in a place like that, and I certainly did, I lived at the, um, uh, actually had two, uh, two slopes coming up to where I lived, and we were in a, an area that hadn't been burned for a long time, but it, the region frequently burned, and all the vegetation was adapted for fire burning. I took the view that if you were going to spend fifteen thousand dollars on renovating inside you probably should think about spending three or four grand or more 
into fire prevention irrigation outside and, and not really fire prevention, it's fire mitigation. Um, have some heavy, uh, heavy sprinklers on your roof um, so that similar to the way the fire trucks do it, uh, that if you do get fire, um, I, I, I would have a, a tank that is always full, whether you have to buy water in or whatever, if you're running out of water, buy it in for preserving your house. One tank, one pump, um, sprinklers to do it. It's not hard to do. Um, yeah, good. I'm, I'm glad you, you, you're, you're on my wavelength there, Naomi. Not really the, the topic we were going to talk about, but, um, but you can pre preserve it. And also, if you, if you live on a property where you ever get someone in with any uh, trenching to do some draining or something, go around and do a ring main around the property, right around the edge, put in a, a, a reasonable size ring main, you know, maybe two inch or three inch, depending on what your pump capability is or whatnot, and a ring main and just um, put some sprinklers in. And if you look like you're going to get uh, hit, turn it on and wet down the edges of your property and wet down, have the cur curtain of water on your house. Um, you know, but people would rather, you know, tile their bathroom, whereas, you know, I reckon it's a great investment, uh, can can be done. Happy to give some advice on that too. Uh, that's one of the things I, I used to do. I used to work in a specialist, uh, in specialist irrigation and design irrigation systems and whatnot. So, so I kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, now, I'm not going to do, uh, because we've got through virtually the... Jeez. Uh, Jeez, we've really got through, uh, got through the time. I will do the rarities um, in the next stream, and I don't know when... I might do that on Wednesday or I might do it on an, a, on the weekend. Um, but it takes, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try and approach it, this, it the way I've done it today where um, I'll just break for this. Yeah, sorry to... Uh, did they have a, a, a fire prevention irrigation system put in uh, Naomi it's a terrible thing to lose the house I mean I'm I was actually working in my nursery on the um, Black Saturday and it was so hot and I could hear the the radio reports coming in and I my nursery was on the edge of a state state park um, and I think I've told the story before I had I had the sprinklers going and I'd built a little creek uh, decorative creek, um, water, long, big, long water feature with pebble, pebbles, gentle flowing water, and birds were coming in from everywhere. And birds that would usually be chasing each other off, they were sitting in the pond, sitting in the the stream, sitting on the pebbles with the water running over just to to stay um, awake and uh, awake, alive. Birds I'd never seen come in uh, from the from the park. Uh, Oh, de yeah, I definitely agree with that, Naomi. There are some, the ferocity of some fires you just can't beat. That's absolutely true. Um, but but you you can do things to uh, to improve improve your chances. And um, uh, putting in something like a ring main is usually the last thing anyone ever thinks about. Would be my. Um, uh, more likely to build a lap pool or something like that. But anyway, that's just me being me being a curmudgeon. Um, so what was I saying? Yeah, so I'm going to approach the rarities, the things to look out for, uh, the same way that we've done today with, you know, the my structure, my categories, um, to give you some other options. If you've got things you want me to bring up or talk about um, or create a list, Lists are good. People like the lists, and it's easy to promote a list. Um, so the uh, 
the 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 top ten that you should try is going to be in the next uh, uh, in the next show. Um, and just quickly, while I, while I've got your attention, uh, more gardening content content as well as the usual bird content. What do you reckon? I get uh, I get far more interaction on the garden shows. I must say. So even though it's uh, even though we're not getting thousands, and that's that's good. It's easy to answer ten questions and five hundred. Right. Uh, I'll just. I'll just wait a little while. Do you just tell me whether you whether you think more gardening or more plant stuff, more habitat gardening is a good idea? Um, I'm just consulting another one of my references about the poas too. I can't find anywhere telling us about um, heavy shade. So yeah, I I would say Naomi, uh, what? What are you trying to grow to grow it under? That's what I'd like to know. That that is probably a better question than how much shade are we talking about? Are you are you thinking about growing? Is this for your difficult spot under the angophora? Look at this. We're having it's just a a show just for Naomi today. Um. Oh, and Chris, one for you if you're still if you're still on board with us. Um, if you can if you can get a picture of either of the blue banded bees or the cuckoo bees in your garden, I would love to see that or them. And you can even email that if you want to me at grant at the bird Um Yeah. All right, I'm going to just. Uh, well, thanks, Naomi. You love the habitat shows. All right, great birds and plants. Um, all right, that's okay. So three different situations. Now the golden rain tree. I'm guessing is that the. Um, the golden panda, or what are we? Common names. I'm never really sure what we're talking about. Let me just uh, let me just check that out and see if I can. Uh... Okay, Colrutia. Okay, which is a tropical uh, plant, which. Um, was really common when I was working in Townsville and I used to see it in the Philippines everywhere as well. Um, let me say, native to Taiwan, let me have a look. Um, uh, I'll just try something out. Um, I'm trying to remember, I don't even think we had a lot of things that grew under it when I was working in Townsville. Um, uh, da, 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 uh, 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 uh. Just checking a whole heap of um, images out there too. It's generally pretty heavy, uh, heavy shade by the look of it for most of them um, I am seeing I am seeing a bunch of things that are growing under it um, in the native uh, it uh, is it in a uh, for you Naomi under your golden rain tree is that a a sort of damp part or a, um, a damper part of the garden than under your angophora? Um, so I'm thinking you might find uh, Lamandras and Dianellas would do okay. Um, 
on, certainly uh, on, at, towards the end of the canopy, I reckon I might try a Canedia prostrata under it as well. Um, maybe even if you wanted to try something really uh, unusual, uh, bland, Blandfordia. Write that one down. Blandfordia. Um, try that one. Okay. Um, okay. Under the Illu your Illawarra flame tree, so that's a Karajong, um, Brachychiton, uh, very damp. Is it, is it damp because of the shade or is it damp because it's in a boggy, a boggy spot? Um, tell me that. Tell me that. Um, depending on that, I'm going to give you a suggestion for a... Uh, I might take that one on notice, actually, Naomi, because I've got a... Uh, because of the shade. Okay, I've got a... Um, uh, I'm just going to make a note. That's what I'm doing. I've now got a note. I've got a Naomi whiteboard now. Um, uh, so... Under the Illawarra flame tree. And what did you say? It's very damp and it's heavy shade. Uh, okay. That one is going under advisement. Um, where will I... Where will I where will I let you know about that, uh, Naomi? Do you want me to put that on the website? Um, or just hang on to it for the... Uh, I'll put it on the website. I'll actually... Here, I'll write this too so I, I make sure I get the page right. So I'll put that on the bird emergency... dot com slash answers how about that did you did you hear that just let let me know if you if you've written that down the bird emergency dot com slash answers so i've written that up i will i will put that up uh probably not till tomorrow yeah there we go okay good i'll, I'll do that um because at four o'clock today, which is two hours from now, we have another live stream and it's about feral cats and how the West Australian feral cat working group are looking to control and manage the scourge of feral cats in the bush. Um, so we might round it off there. Your last opportunity for a question or a comment or something that you'd like me to chase up. Um, oh, Naomi, just while I've got there, I'm going to put the golden golden rain tree up on this list as well. Um, I can see plenty of... Uh, actually, where you are, these will all be probably... Um, I can give you some, excuse me, I can give you some recommendations that aren't native that will certainly do okay. I'm seeing some really good uh, suggestions that are applied around the world. Um, oh, gee, actually, here's a beauty. Let me, let me go to... Ah... Oh. Collius are being used under in in there. That's really interesting. Um, so Naomi, let me know if you are open to some. Just, I'm guessing you just want to cover up the ground uh, rather than have it as open space. So if you if you're amenable to using um, uh, up, 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 using some exotics rather than just natives i i will give you some ideas there 
Have you tried any azaleas or any of the small rhododendrons? That might be a, a good place to start. But let me know if you're interested in uh, in some natives as well. So just uh, just let me that know that before we before we wrap up. Um, Chris, thanks for your um, uh, contributions today. Jeez, Naomi, this has basically been uh, a one-on-one -on -one, um, <laughs> consultation for your garden today. That's really, really quite cool. Um, all right, there's, yeah, I did wonder about this because of your location. Happy to use exotics if, if they won't be but weeds. Don't worry, I will try never, ever to um, recommend a plant that's got weed potential. If I know about its weed potential, it won't be being recommended by me in any, in any situation. Um, it's one of the reasons there's a lot of acacias that I don't recommend because they've got uh, weed potential. So, okay. Well, you're on my little whiteboard, Naomi, so I will um, I'll get to that and um, I'll... Yeah, I'll, I'll try and put a notice on Facebook as well when I've updated that page. Answers. Um, be interesting to see if anyone goes and looks at it, apart from you. Um, okay, everyone. Um, I've got to. Uh, I've got to get ready for uh, the cat, the feral cat show. Um, thanks again. It's always great when you come and be part of the bird emergency, bird-friendly habitat gardening hour. Uh, that's what we're going to call it from now on, habitat gardening, uh, bird-friendly habitat gardening. Okay. Um, thanks for being with us again, guys. Uh, guys and girls. I'm old. I always say guys. Um, it's great. See you later. Stick around. Oh, don't stick around. Come back at four o'clock uh, Eastern if you want to know about feral cats and meet ecologist Judy Dunlop, who's part of the Western Australian Feral Cat Working Group. Thanks, Naomi. See you later, everyone. Bye.